Hello! If you're watching this, you're in my video game design class, also known as CS1010, uh, where we're talking through video game design. This is one of the more um, informational units. This is actually probably the topic I have to say the most about, because think about it. When you play a video game, this is probably the most important thing, is your game world, how, how, how what the game world looks like, how the game world makes you feel, how things react in the, the game world. And so we have a lot of information to go through when it comes to designing a world that your players can feel immersed in, designing a world they want to be in, designing a world uh, that they want to explore and they want to uh, be creative for um, and uh, create in and all that type of stuff. Um, this is probably the most important thing. And certainly in the last five years, open world games have become a very important genre and now every game is expected to be somewhat open world and so all the more reason if open world is the fad of the moment when i'm filming this video uh all the more reason you want to pay a lot of attention to what your game world is going to look like and so so let's talk about video game worlds and and what makes them so unique and also what makes some of them rather stink what makes some of them not so great um First of all, you need to know there's five dimensions of your game's world, five things you have to think about when you design a world for a video game. The first is your physical dimension, which is simply what is the world? What is the world uh, made up of? How big is it? What are the boundaries? Um, things like that. So we'll talk more about that. The second is environmental. Environmental isn't what is it, it's what is inside of it. Well, how are you going to fill up that world and create an environment? Um, so it's not just an empty map. You're Sort of walking through and then there's a time element also known as the temporal dimension how does time pass in your world we'll talk about that then you have the emotional dimension how does your world feel uh, how, how are people feeling when they're playing your game what do you want them to feel how are you going to design the music and the sound effects and the look of the game to feel that way and then last we have the ethical dimension which is what is right and what is wrong in your world and how is that enforced so we're going to talk about each of these five uh turn in turn once again the physical is the longest one um the next four we go through pretty quickly uh so buckle in for the physical dimension um Physical dimension questions, and every lecture from here on out is going to be a series of questions I'm going to ask you about your game. Or these are actually the questions you should be asking yourself or your coworker, your partner about your game, and all the questions at the end of every week that are due about your game from the book uh, for the class are, are going to be variations of these questions. And so the physical dimension, the first question is how big is your world going to be? Uh, how big is it going to be? Just how, what, what is the, what is the scale? and the scope of your game. Uh, looking at two games, we have Pac-Man on the left and Zelda on the right. Pac-Man's world is very small. You see Pac-Man's world right there. It's not going to be very big. It's just a series of hallways. If we were to do three-dimensional Pac-Man, which I'll have to Google that to see if somebody has, uh, it would be a very small world. It, it, would, it would be the size of a, a floor of a building is really what you're looking at on the left there. It's a floor of a building. Um, then if you look on the right, um, this is Breath of the Wild, uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild came out a few years ago, uh, you're looking at maybe one-tenth of the world in that scene right here on the right. You're looking at a very small portion uh, of that world. That world was designed to be as big as the city limits of Tokyo, Japan. Um, some of you actually probably are from Japan and have been to Tokyo. You know how big the city is. Um, so so think, hey, if you're here in Salt Lake where I live, think about the city limits of sort of a county, of Davis County. It was meant to be a county-sized map. And so so think about how long it would take you to roam around our county if you're roaming around on foot and climbing up things. A uh, uh, county is a big thing. And so, so we ask, how big is the world going to be? The next question is, how is the world bounded? Let's go back. Yeah. What are the boundaries of your world? And how does the player know when they've bumped up against a, a boundary? How big is your world going to be? But what are the boundaries? How are you going to let them know that they can't go further? Um, or some, now we have games that are boundaryless games and then we could talk about that more i'm not going to talk about it here um but but what are the boundaries uh let me give you some examples of game boundaries this is super mario 64 super mario put every
every single map and floating in a bubble. And so the boundaries of the world were just cliffs that you would fall off of, and if you fell out of them, you would die. They also marked off the sides and the top of the bubble. Uh, so think of a cube. And uh, one of the most fun things we did when this game came out when I was like 12 years old was you could actually do a long jump into the side of the map. So even though behind Mario here, it looks like the blue goes on forever, you could actually jump far enough and you could hit the side, like just like you're hitting a wall and Mario would bounce off of it and fall to his death. It was kind of fun to do that. We were also a little bit sadistic, just long jumping Mario off to see if we could hit the side of the the map there and so so that was one way that world was bounded or the levels of that game were bounded you would bump up against a, a wall to, just an imaginary wall kind of out there invisible wall transparent wall there's what i'm looking for or you could fall off and just float down and game over another example of a great boundary is in some two-dimensional games this is stardew valley i'm going to talk more about stardew valley here notice there's a cliff behind those four horse riders right there so you just build a cliff that there's absolutely no way for the avatar to climb there's there's no way to get my avatar off that cliff or up that cliff to any more of the map. And so that's a very natural boundary. It's called a natural boundary where there's just a wall and the player cannot get over it. Uh, natural boundaries are also fun because you can actually create ways for players to get over them and access hidden parts of the map. And Stardew Valley actually has a few of those and other games too. Uh, even the Super Mario, the early Super Mario games had hidden parts where it looked like there was a natural boundary, but you could sneak around it, uh, which is always a really fun um, thing to do. So if you use natural boundaries, you can hide little Easter eggs in there. You can hide little secrets in there for the player to find. Maybe 90% of the wall is not traversable, but maybe there's a little section that is, right? And so that's a natural boundary. Um, and so then you another tactic a lot of games have used is they just throw up a message like in Breath of the Wild here where they say, you can't go any farther. Sorry. Turn around. Go the other way. Skyrim does this. Um, Batman, the Batman Arkham games. I wasn't able to find a picture or video for this. Uh, but Batman Arkham games actually have guns shoot at you. And Batman says something like, I have to stay in Arkham City. And he sort of twirls his cape around and flies the other way or floats the other way, glides, whatever Batman does. Um, so so those are, are sort of a mix between a natural boundary and just sort of a game boundary. And there's no way to get any further. And they throw up the warning saying, don't try to go farther. You're just going to you can't. You can't go further. Uh, so that's another way is just tell them. You know, Star Skyrim has all kinds of roads out of Skyrim, but if you try to take them, it will say, you can't leave Skyrim right now. You get a message. So that's another way to do your boundaries. How are your boundaries, uh, and how does the player know that they can't go past this boundary? That's the other question. Then the next, the two really big questions on the physical dimension, the two things that are very important to understand when you're designing a video game is number three, how are things scaled? And, and are you going to use multiple scales? Here's the problem uh, with video games. And this has been a problem from the very early days of video games is that um, depending on the camera angle, there are certain angles where... Um, where an object, if it appears in its actual physical world counterpart or a scale, um, then you wouldn't be able to see it. So right now I'm at my desk, and if I were to pick up my computer mouse, if there is a camera in my ceiling and there was a player controlling me, chances are that mouse would be maybe one or two pixels, depending on how scaled the game is. And so a computer mouse is tiny compared to a, a human. And so if I made a video game and that requires a computer mouse, um, then I can't, I have to scale the mouse up. I have to make the mouse look bigger than the human uh, or than it actually is so that the player knows it's there. Um, and it gets more tricky when we get into multiple scales, which I'm going to talk about. So let me go back to Stardew Valley. Here, the character, uh, the player is holding a chest above his head. See how big that chest looks? Uh, chests are a big thing, but they're not as big as a human. But if you look, the chest is the exact same amount of pixels as the character underneath it. And there, you know, unless he's a bodybuilder, there's no way he can pick that chest up above his head and hold it there. I think I have in the next one, he's holding a part of uh, uh, cauliflower or something there. And also notice how big the pumpkins are. The, um, the pumpkins are up to their waists. Now, I've seen some big pumpkins in my day. We actually could, can grow them as big as a person, but the average pumpkin is, is a lot less. 
less than than uh, than up to the waist of a person, unless you're a really tiny person. Uh, and so that vegetable is huge. If that vegetable was real in real life, he'd be winning county fair competitions, right? Also notice up there, the grapevines are as tall as the person. Uh, there's grapevines at the top of the screen and cornrows. Those are actually as tall as a person. And so the pumpkin is, is tall. If I pick corn off of that vine up there, I pick grapes, the grapes are actually as big as the vine. Isn't that funny? And so what scale are you going to use? How are you going to have to scale items up so that the player can see them and know what they're for and know that they have them? That's a question you have to ask. What what items are you going to have to scale up? What items are you going to have to scale down? Um, so, uh, so that's a question we have to ask. Another question that goes along with the scale is, are you going to switch scales? Are, are, are items going to change in height and size? The great example of this um, is uh, the shed in Stardew Valley. So keeping with Stardew Valley uh, is the sheds. And so in Stardew Valley, you can count right there how many squares the shed takes up on the screen. It's about six across and about six up. And the ceiling's a little bit taller. The roof's a little bit taller there. But guess what happens when you go inside the shed? When you go inside the shed, it's 10 by 10, or actually I think it's 11 by 11. You can count right there. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, 10 by about 11 across. Uh, so even though the shed um, is only six by six in the overworld, when you go inside, the inside gets bigger. It gets larger. It's bigger on the inside. And that's so that you can create little household things like this. Obviously, if the shed stayed the same size, six by six, you wouldn't be able to do much with it. Why would you even build one? Just put it on the overworld map. Nothing decays if it's outside. And so um, so you see the scale shifted from six by six to 10 by 11, uh, or however many are across there. Yeah, it is 10 by 11 plus the wall behind. Um, so that's an example of changing your scale to, to make the game more fun, to make it more playable. Another thing, uh, another example of this is Japanese RPG games. Right there, this is Final Fantasy VI from the mid-90s. Um, right there, the character is as tall as the airship. And she actually, and the airship is three times wider than her. And so she's as tall as the airship, three times wider. But guess what happens when you go inside the airship? She's a fraction of the size of the airship. Um, I forgot to put a picture in there of inside the airship. When she goes inside the airship, the airship is massive and it's huge. It's the size of an airship compared to her. The airship is like 100 by 100 squares large, where here it's just 1 by 3. And so, so when she goes inside, from the overworld inside the ship, the scale changes. JRPGs work the same with cities. When you go inside a city, the city gets way bigger. On the world map, the city is exactly the same size as the character. When you go inside the city, it's massive. It's city-sized. Um, another change in scale in Japanese RPG games is when you go to battle. Uh, when you get into a battle, this is what you see, but this is actually one square on the overmap. And so it's like the camera is zooming in uh, to focus on one little square of the map while you fight the dragon. And then when you defeat the dragon, you go back out to the overworld. The, that, that, that battle scene shrinks back down to one tiny little square of the over map. So JRPGs actually have three scales. Uh, you have an overworld scale where the cities appear very small. You have a city scale where the cities appear city size. And then you have a battle scale uh, where it's the size of a battlefield. Um, and yet that's just one square on the over map. So they, they switch scales. Um, to to convey the game and to make the game more fun and more playable. And so the next, so that question is how were things scaled and did were multiple scales used? Are you going to change the scale like those games did, or is your game going to be kind of like um, kind of like a first person shooter or even Skyrim, some of the American RPGs, uh, where uh, you just all items stay the same size no matter what game mode you're in. Um, and so, and yet even Skyrim changes the size of the cities when you go inside the cities, which is interesting. Although Zelda didn't, um, Breath of the Wild. And then the last question with the physical dimension is how many spatial dimensions does your world have? Here's where things get confusing because the dimensions of your game world we just went over, but there's also something called spatial dimensions, which refers to uh, the camera's angle. And so typically there's four um, different spatial dimensions. There's 2D, 3D, 2.5D, 
and 4D. So let me talk you through them. 2D just means the avatar can go up, down, left, or right. So look, there's uh, Super Mario World there. Super Mario World is a 2D game. Super Mario can go up. He can go up to the left. He can go up to the right. He can go down. He can go down to the left and down to the right. It's two-dimensional, and the camera is in front of Mario. So you are the camera. You're looking at Mario. Uh, Mario can't go forward and backwards. He can only go up and down, left and right, and the variations there. Up. So that's a two-dimensional game where um, where you can only go one way. Most early video games were two-dimensional. Pac-Man's two-dimensional. Pong is two-dimensional. Um, uh, uh, King Kong, uh, sorry, uh, Donkey Kong is two-dimensional. Um, but then we have, of course, three-dimensional. You, you guys all play three-dimensional games. Halo, classic three-dimensional game. Uh, that means you're it's a full three-dimensional world. And, and so instead of up, down, left, and right, you can also go forward and back. And you could go forward and up and down and left and down and right and down and back. Uh, so that's a three-dimensional game. Notice also that a common example of scale is if you actually held a gun that size uh, uh, up to in front of you, uh, it wouldn't take up that much pixels of your vision. It wouldn't take up that much camera space. So notice in first-person shooters, uh, guns are scaled up to look much bigger than they look, so you can know what you're uh, aiming at. So that picture is also a great example of scale, where the gun is as big as the people who are running next to you. Isn't that funny? Uh, if they're standing right next to you. So, um, so yeah, but this is a three-dimensional game. But then you have two other dimensions that have been used very creatively in games, and actually some of my favorite games aren't 2D or 3D, but are actually 2.5D and 4D. So 2.5D is where you tilt the two-dimensional camera back on its side so it appears three-dimensional, but it's not really three-dimensional. And so um, Octopath Traveler came out a few years ago, and it's a two-and-a-half-dimension game, meaning that you can climb stairs and then go back to further areas. So in a two-and-a-half-dimensional game, you still go left, right, up, down, but you can also um, move up the map and down the map because it's tilted from 2D back down about 45 degrees. The camera's kind of moved up, which tilts the map down. And so notice you can go in front of those stairs there if that character keeps going straight, or she can go up, back, up, back, and she can go down, forward, down, forward. And so it creates another dimension where you can kind of layer your map in some really creative ways. Another genre that uses this is a uh, real-time strategy game. So this is StarCraft II. Uh, StarCraft II is two and a half dimensions. Um, you could go up hills and down hills in StarCraft II. You can perch your uh, artillery units on the top of hills and they can fire down at enemies uh, below and the enemies can't fire back up at them. Um, and so that adds a layer of tactics tactician, a layer of strategy to games when you tilt the map down. Um, so uh, so StarCraft is not three-dimensional, but it is not really two-dimensional either because you can actually move characters up a hill and down a hill, uh, just like Octopath Traveler. So that's two and a half dimensions, which is really fun. Um, really a fun way to design your game, to just tilt it back a little bit to give the player that much more maneuverability and strategy. And then we have four-dimensional. Four-dimensional maps are where the player can travel through a portal to a map that looks exactly like the other map, but things they change in one map carry over to affect the other map. And so um, so on the left there is, this is Link to the Past. Link to the Past was one of the early games to use four dimensions. Those of you who maybe are fans of the Netflix show Stranger Things, there's actually a Stranger Things game they released two or three years ago that was kind of a, that was very heavily inspired by Link to the Past where they add the upside down as a fourth dimension, uh, if you know that show. And so notice in the middle of the map on the left, you have a pyramid and in the middle of the castle on the right, you have a castle. Notice at the top, you have a tower and at the top there you have a tower um, but notice um, oh you have a lake below and a lake below um, and, a, and a lake on the one side is a desert on the other side and so if you flood one area of the map it actually carries over into the fourth dimension and so the player is basically on the same map it looks different but very similarities but they can journey between worlds and 
doing something in the one world affects the other world. It's a great way to do puzzles, and Link to the Past had some of the best early puzzles of any game out there. So, uh, so this is the fourth dimension, adding that fourth element where maybe it's a 2D game, and yet you can travel forward and backwards through multiple dimensions, and something you change in one affects the other, and you have to figure out how to use that to your players, to your character's advantage. Very fun way of, of building a game, and I'd encourage you to grab Link to the Past or the Stranger Things game because uh, it's a lot of fun uh, doing that. And so that's four-dimensional. Uh, that's your game's spaces, your spatial dimension, your physical dimension of your game is how big is it, how is it bounded, um, uh, is what what angle is the camera at, and how does that affect gameplay, um, and, and how are you scaling things so that players can see them, but it still remains sort of um, intact. So, um, so that's the big one. Uh, take a second break, pause this video, and come back for the other four, which won't take nearly as long because the physical world's the biggest one. Uh, so take a break, uh, maybe pause this, maybe come back to it tomorrow and start right at the 20-minute mark. And I'm going to assume you do that, so welcome back to tomorrow. We talked about the physical dimension. Let's talk about the environmental dimension. Remember, the physical dimension is what your world is, like how big it is, uh, the dimensions of it, um, uh, the spatial dimensions of it, the scale of it, it's, it's how things relate to each other in your world and, and things like that. The environmental dimension then is, is what are you going to put in your world? The first question here is now we're bouncing out of game genres to fictional genres. Uh, you guys know the genres of fiction. Uh, I listed them right there on the slide for you. Uh, what, what genre do you want your game to mimic? What, what genre do you want your game to copy? Do you want do you want your game to be set in a medieval realm like Skyrim was, uh, uh, where there's castles and maidens and princesses and princes and lords and vassals and, and dragons and uh, caves to explore? Do you want it to be science fiction? Do you want to be traveling to different planets and on a spaceship? Uh, cyberpunk's kind of a fun one. Uh, uh, you can look that one up. A space opera is different than science fiction, but they have a lot in common. Uh, you can do that. Is your game genre real world drama? Is it a drama game? Or is your character just living in a house? Stardew Valley, which I've already mentioned quite a bit, is a farming simulator happening in the real world. It's meant to mimic the real world, and yet the environment of the game of Stardew Valley is very rural, uh, very sort of cartoon rural. And so, um, so what fictional genre does your game mimic? And uh, part of that is what time period is it in? Is it in the Roman Empire um, or the Greek uh, Empire, like the Assassin's Creed games? Uh, is, it, uh, is it in space in the future, right? And then the second question there is, how are you going to design your objects to give the game that style? And how are the objects in your game world going to look so that the player knows this is a medieval realm or this is science fiction? And how are they going to feel? Um, give you an example of this. Uh, right now, when I, while I'm filming this video, the game Among Us is blowing up. Among Us is not a visually sort of pretty appealing game, but it borrows a ton from sort of the space horror genre. If you've watched any of the 70s, 80s sort of horror, science fiction horror movies like Alien or even Aliens and all the spinoffs thereof, um, you know that this game was made to mimic um, that. And so right from the get-go, you are your environment is a spaceship or a lab, a scientific lab, and it's kind of a dusty one. It's a dirty lab. You see broken dishes in the cafeteria there. You see random things spread apart. Uh, the colors are dark. That's another question you'd ask. What color scheme um, am I going to use to convey sort of that environment? Notice the storage is sort of messy. The, the objects themselves, there's no real good hard squares. Everything's sort of, all the boundaries of everything is messy. So you notice how this plays through to the avatars of the game? The avatars themselves are just sort of messy blobs uh, with big noses there, and even the hats don't have straight edges. And so, so Among Us, the environment of Among Us, is a very chaotic, messy world, and that adds to the horror environment of it, where the game is two imposters who are trying to murder everybody. That's a horror movie, right? And so, um, so the environment of that game was very intentionally designed to mimic space horror movies. That was the genre, and they designed the game to mimic it. And so compare that to Halo. In, in Halo, everything's bright. Everything's clean. Um, and Halo is about trying to preserve beauty, and the aliens, the Horde, right, are destroying that beauty. And so in Halo, 
very different from Among Us. Halo's more of a space opera science fiction genre where, where the game is designed, uh, the game opens on these beautiful sunny beaches, which is just so cool. And, 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 um, and so the palettes are light. Even Master Chief himself is kind of shiny looking. And so, uh, and so the environment of Halo is a very lush forest. Um, and yet you dig into the scientific technology part and yet it's a very futuristic science fiction feel. And so how, so what genre is your game and how are the objects designed to, to, to build an environment, an environment that feels real, that feels like you're living there. Um, and so, um, so that's the environmental dimension. Let me click back to the questions. How do the characters act in your world? How do they talk to, to sort of fit that environment? Do they have a lisp? Do they have an accent? Uh, uh, do they talk like normal people? Um, what objects are you going to put in your world? Um, obviously, you're not going to put a big castle in a science horror uh game, right? You're not going to uh, put a spaceship in medieval London. Um, so, and then what color palette are you using, which I talked about? Um, so those are the environmental questions. Then we have the temporal dimension. This is the third dimension. Now we did the physical and we did the environmental. Now we're going to talk about time. How does the passing of time in your game affect what the player can do? In, in old games, um, there wasn't passing of time. In fact, time didn't pass until you completed story. That's how time passed. Those games are always so funny to replay because you'll meet with a king in the game. Your avatar will meet with the king and the king will say, the princess has been kidnapped. She is going to get murdered and she's going to get murdered soon if you don't get over there. And it might take you three, four hours to get over there. You might visit 10 other cities before you get over there. You might meet so many other people and do so many side quests. And yet time doesn't pass until you get to her and then uh the bad guy months later is still dangling her off the tower being like oh, i'll drop her if you come closer it's like wouldn't have arm have gotten tired by then you know um so that's how time passed in older games there's still plenty of games where time passes that way where it just doesn't it's always day it's always the same day. it always feels like the same day and yet you're traveling all over the world in that one day and things and even though the story tells you things are happening very quickly there's hardly any passing of time until of course it's like the castle is going to collapse and you have 10 minutes to get out of here then you better get out of there right um and so um so that's called story beats how does time pass well it's the story beats the when you finish a story uh, element, then everything changes. And so some games, uh, there are side quests that won't unlock till you get to a certain point in the story. So if you visit a guy, uh, he's like, oh, I think I'm going to die really soon. But you know what? I, I'm feeling good, just a little bit sick. And then you visit him six months later in the game and he still feels a little bit sick. But then when you be a part of the story, you come back and he's like, I'm going to die now unless you bring me this medicine, right? So the story advances the time. Um, the story is what uh, makes time pass. The other way of making time pass is just using an in-game clock. Just using a clock in the game um, where you have a day-night cycle and it's always the same time. And then if you're going to use an in-game clock, the next question is, are you going to tell people about the clock? Are you going to show it to people? So here, once again, is Skyrim. If you see in the top uh, right corner there, it says Monday the 15th. Uh, you have icons that tell you what time of day it is. And then you have uh, time there. Uh, that tells you the time. And in Stardew Valley, it's about 15 minutes of uh, real world time. 15 minutes of gameplay time equals one day. And so 10 minutes pass uh, about every minute and a half in that game, if I'm doing the math correctly. And that is true in Stardew Valley, no matter what you're doing. The only time it breaks is for the, the mini game. You can sit and play the mini game for three hours and no time will have passed in the in the game. You will have wasted three real world hours of your life, but no other time would have passed. So that's kind of a, a neat thing. So in Stardew Valley, you have a clock, you have a day night cycle. In Stardew Valley, if you're not in bed by two, you pass out and you wake up in your bed the next morning with your energy bar there in the bottom right corner, half. Uh, and so you have to be in bed by two which is actually a really neat thing. Most games have a day-night cycle, but they never let make the player go to sleep. So that's a great example from Stardew Valley. It has an in-game clock. The in-game clock never changes except for that one case. Um, and they do tell you the game clock in the calendar. Um, 
then question number four is how variable is the time? And does that variable change from mode to mode? Ocarina of Time was a, a Zelda game in the 90s. Um, they had a day-night cycle. If it was day, certain monsters would come out. If it was night, certain other monsters would come out. Um, but they stopped the clock in the village. So if you went into a village when it was night, it would stay night for as long as you were in that village. If you came out of the village, then, it, then the clock would resume. Um, and so that was actually kind of a neat thing because you could go, you could leave the village, wait until it was night, go back into the village, and all the non-playable characters would have changed. There were side quests that would open up. There were stores that would open during the day and close at night. Um, but you didn't have to worry about getting to the store on time once you were in the village. Once you're in the village, you could do all the night stuff at once, leave, wait for day, come back, do all the day stuff at once. Um, so Ocarina of Time actually stopped time um, in villages, uh, which is kind of a crazy thing. Uh, other games, like Skyrim, doesn't stop the clock for anything. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles is a series I just played through. They don't stop the clock for anything. Um, but many games, as I said, do stop the time during mini games. So if you're in a mini game or if you're in a cutscene, then no time passes. In Stardew Valley, if you get, get into a cutscene, the cutscene might last 15 minutes itself. But when you come back, it will be the same day, same time as when you went into the cutscene. And so the question there is, how variable is the game's time to real time? And does that variable change from mode to mode? Um, there are several games now that um, aren't variable to real time. They just run in real time. And so there are plenty of games now where if it's if I have my computer clock set to 1 o'clock on a Sunday, then in the game it's 1 o'clock on Sunday, and I have to wait. A long time till uh, till it's night. I have to actually turn the game on at midnight and play the game at midnight, um, or play with my in-game clock. I mean, my in-machine clock. So, uh, so there's that too. Uh, Farmville came out. Oh, geez, 20, uh, 15 years ago, and that was a game on um, actually it's 10 years ago. That was a game on Facebook with, that happened in real time. You know, where crops grew in real time and day. If you logged in at night, it was night in the game. If you logged in at day, it was day in the game. And so, uh, so yeah. So how variable is your time? How does time pass? How does that affect the story? That's the temporal dimension. And then last, but certainly not, oh, nope, we have two more. Uh, now we're on the emotional dimension. Not last, but also certainly not least. Um, what do you want the player to feel as they play your game? Well, how does your game feel? I, I talked earlier about Among Us. Among Us is a horror, um, a, a horror game. It's it's based off of science fiction horror shows, and so you you so the designers of that game wanted you to feel tense as you played the game. And if you notice, if you play it after listening to this, pay attention to the sound effects, pay attention to the music, pay attention to just how it looks, which I already talked about. Um, you feel tense as you play the game. They give you timed missions that you have to complete, tasks, and that, that's added as a way of creating tension. And so the emotional dimension of Among Us is tension, is stress. That's what they want to make you feel. And that's part of what makes it so fun, is the stress, and especially where you're playing it with people and it bleeds over into things. So obviously the next question there is what sound effects and music are you going to play? This is where sound effects and music come in. Sound effects and music are a huge part of the emotional dimension of a game. They're also a huge part to the emotional dimension of a TV show or a movie, right? Um, what are you going to play to make them feel what you want them to feel? And then the third question is what cinematography are you going to use to convey those emotions? Um, is the game, question four, is the game going to take back control of the camera for those cinematic moments. Uh, this is a huge difference between American RPGs and JRPGs. American RPGs largely let the player control the camera during the cinematic scenes. JRPGs take control of the camera so they can so they can use the camera and the angles of the camera um, to actually make you feel what's going on. If I'm in a cutscene in Skyrim, which is an American RPG, I can be looking away from the person talking to me. There's so many things I've missed in Skyrim because I, act, I, I made my character walk away and suddenly someone dies. I'm like, wait, what just happened back there? The reason Skyrim does that is to make it feel like real life. In real life, I, things happen and I'm not paying attention. Uh, a while back, my wife was going for a walk and I said, have a good walk, hon, and went to the kitchen. And right as I walked into the kitchen, she fell down the stairs and sprained her ankle. And I was looking away and missed it. That's real life. But JRPGs, 
want you want to control the camera and control the angles and control how you feel. To give you an example of this and take a short break from talking, um, I want to show you one of the uh, largest emotional moments of any video game ever. I don't care who you are, I will fight you on this. This is one of the best, most emotional moments of any video game ever, and it comes from Final Fantasy VII. A few things I want you to pay attention to uh, as you watch it. Um, pay attention to these four questions. guys see that sorry i have to wipe tears out of my eyes just kidding i'm joking um but did you see how they uh took control of the camera um and then did you see the music that was playing did you see the the cinematography of the camera sort of fell in front of uh the bad guy with that massive awesome sword that he had i want that sword that's an awesome sword uh and did you see how the music then suddenly changed from tense to oh no something bad's gonna happen to the da -da -da. Da, 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 right the the soft melodious music and then it gave the player back control of the camera um and then took over the dialogue so that's that's the question you have to ask in skyrim uh you may have been facing away and not even seen sephiroth jump out of nowhere with his giant sword uh but in in Final Fantasy VII, which is what this was, they made you watch. Um, are you going to make players watch, or are you going to not make them watch um, those things? And so um, so that's the emotional dimension. What music are you going to play? What sound effects? What, cine what cinematography are you going to use uh, to make people feel um, what they feel? And now, last but also not least, the ethical dimension. Um, early video games had no ethical dimension. Uh, the issues of right and wrong, we didn't really think of those. In fact, oftentimes, a lot of times, we just gave the player a gun and said, go kill whoever, right? Uh, it wasn't until the mid-90s you really started to see an ethical dimension in games. I remember GoldenEye on the Nintendo 64. Uh, you had to rescue hostages, and spoiler alert, you couldn't kill the hostages. They would game over you if you shot one of the hostages. And so that was their way of telling you that is wrong. We only kill bad guys, right? Um, and so the now the ethical dimension is huge, and it's fleshed out in really incredible ways ways in video games. So what is right and wrong in your world? Um, what What is defined as being good and what is defined as being bad? And how are you going to reward the player, punish the player for violating uh, the world's ethics? Um, how are you going to say, bad, you know, if you shoot a hostage, you game over, right? Um, so don't do that. That's bad. That's something James Bond would never do, right? Um, so we're going to punish you by doing that. Um, how are we going to reward you for living into that? And and part of this question is comes from education. Uh, when we take education classes as your teacher guys, we're asked to keep in mind our hidden curriculum. 
Hidden curriculum means all the things we're teaching by not teaching. This is everything from how I act as a teacher in the classroom. Do I dress respectfully? Uh, if I walked in with a hat on kind of sideways and dressed in a raggedy t-shirt with holes in it and, and beat up jeans, you guys aren't going to respect me. That's the hidden curriculum that says this isn't really all that important. Where well, education is really important. So how the teacher dresses, um, what, what type of movie clips we use as part of our hidden curriculum. And so what is your game's hidden curriculum? Now, what is the hidden sort of things you're going to hide in the programming of your game, designing of your game uh, to really encourage people? So to give you an example of that, Skyrim, um, has a right and wrong system in the world. In, this, in the world, you cannot kill people. Um, and that's in the world. That's in the actual world game. You cannot kill people and you cannot steal. And yet, anybody who's played Skyrim will tell you the two most fun things to do in that game is assassinate people and steal things. And so Skyrim's system, the hidden curriculum, is don't get caught. Um, and so I remember reading so many, like, how to play Skyrim for beginners guides that, that tell you that, uh, that it doesn't matter. I mean, if you kill someone and nobody sees you, you'll get away with it. Well, in the real world, that's wrong. That's very bad. It's still bad whether you get away with it or not. And to tell you guys the truth, in the real world, you don't get away for it. I've known very few people who've actually gotten away with things in the real world, at least for long. It will catch, your past will catch up with you in the real world. Skyrim, not so much. It's hidden curriculum is don't get caught. It's actual morality of the world is don't do it. You end up in jail. You end up being attacked by all the guards. Um, but the hidden curriculum is just don't get caught, um, which is interesting. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic was one of the first games to have a really fleshed out ethical dimension. Um, and that fleshed out ethical dimension was based off of your dialogue choices. You could become a Sith Lord or a Jedi Knight. And Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, to be honest, is kind of more fun to be a Sith Lord, uh, right? Because you could throw lightning at people. I always was just a enough of a Sith Lord to get the lightning power. Um, and then and then I did all the good the the good side of the Force uh, options. And so Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic gives you the option to be Sith Lord or Jedi Knight, uh, but they made it a lot more fun to be on the dark side. And so they made it enticing. And then the designers of that game were asking you in the real world, um, are you willing to be good even if it costs you something? Um, in Knights of the Old Republic, who cares? But in the real world, that's a, that's a tough question we should talk about. Are you willing to be good when it's not good to be good? Are you willing to be good even when you're being punished for it, even when there's sort of hindrances that happen? And so, uh, but then you compare that to like Zelda or even the Final Fantasy games or anything where you could just walk into a house and steal stuff, right? Where it's not wrong in that world to just walk into somebody's house and smash all their pots and take whatever money you find lying around. Um, and so that's the hidden curriculum of Zelda and a lot of the Final Fantasy games and other RPGs is just go inside and steal stuff. It's, people see you, they don't even say anything. They just let you do it in those games. And so Zelda has very little ethical dimension, where Skyrim and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic have major ethical um, dimensions. And so these are all the things you have to think through. These are all the things you have to um, talk about and think through when you're creating your game world. What is in it? That's the physical dimension. What are you going to put in it that, that creates an environment? Um, and, and that's the environment dimension. How's time going to pass? And, and is the passing of time going to affect the player's choices at all? That's the temporal dimension. Um, uh, what's the emotional dimension? What do you want the player to feel? And what sounds are you going to play? What, what, what dialogue are you going to put in there? What cutscenes are you going to have? And then you have the ethical dimension. What's right and wrong? And, and what's the player going to be rewarded for and punished for? And how are they going to handle that? So, uh, so I know this has been long. As I said, this is the most uh, um, information heavy unit we do because it's the most important part of any video game. Uh, I look forward to reading about your games and the games you're going to design and how you're going to handle all these questions that I've asked. Don't forget to actually consult the questions because they are different than what's on the screen here. Uh, so good luck out there, guys. And I really look forward to reading more about your video games and seeing how you answer these questions for your games. Stay loose.